there's a gaming term called power creep. And it applies a lot to fiction writing, both in comics and in just general fiction writing, uh, which is the longer a story progresses, the harder it is to make stakes. Because your characters evolve over the course of it. And as it builds up and builds up, you start with a character who's limited and end with a character who's so expansive that you have to figure out something that actually threatens up here. It happens with comic books more obviously. You get to a point where every other story arc is some galactic threat that's going to destroy the universe. And after five of those, you're like, okay, here's another one. <laughs> Do you feel continually let down by modern media? Do you miss the good old days? back when all that mattered was a good story and not some agenda? Do you have ambitions of picking up a pen and pad and fighting the creative war yourself? Then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I'm going to talk to a creator who said enough is enough and started making the content they wished was out there. Join us as we discuss the ups and downs of the self-publishing world. We want to help empower you to join the Iron Age of Media. Welcome to Iron Age Marketing. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Iron Age Marketing. I'm Nikki P. here, as always. Today's guest is Mr. Daniel P. Riley of Whimsyland.org. How are we doing today, Daniel? I'm doing great. Got all my client work sorted out, and taking some time to talk with you. Awesome. I like when people take time to talk to me, dude. It's just like taking time to talk to everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Mass communication, is that what we're doing here? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, well, why don't we start things out by uh, hearing a little bit about who you are. Um, There's no guarantees that everyone who listens to this knows how famous and important you are in the world. (laughs) So let's let's introduce them to that. Well, I am Daniel P. Riley, owner and operator of whimsyland.org, which is literary coaching and services. I coach authors, uh, help people brainstorm book blurbs, uh, anything that they really need in order to get from that first word to the end and everything that happens afterwards pre-publishing. I'm working on trying to get to a point where I can maybe start publishing some books for folks. But at this point, I'm just a back-end support guy. And I do editing, which is sort of my current focus. And so when I'm curious, what is the uh, the big thing that kind of prevents someone from just going straight into publishing for other people? Is it a finance thing, like having the ability to front money for certain things, or are there other kinds of hurdles that I, I'd be unaware of? There are a bunch of hurdles. Finances is one of the big ones. Uh, the other one is printing costs, and you kind of need to have either access or the equipment yourself in-house. Uh, I'm looking at combining with a couple of local printers here to use their equipment to branch into that as uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Maybe like a, like a business timeshare where on, on their off hours, I have access to the shop so that I can print and do what I need to do. And then I vacate so that they can do what they need to do uh, until I can find a, place to start my own shop but yeah cost is really the big factor to doing any sort of small print publishing you you really need to be business savvy about where you're getting your materials from the equipment that you'll need and to use that equipment effectively interesting now we're talking about what you've created i guess the real question is so what brings you to that world how do you uh how do you find yourself being an editor or being, you know, a coach to the uh, the up and coming? And is there like a special angle that you take? Because there are a lot of services out there now that will help people coach to make their books a thing and make them a reality. For those who watch the show, if you go to the show notes, uh, there's actually a pitch for is it uh, for a friend of mine, uh, his uh, service, boostwithabook.com. And 
you know, his he definitely focuses more on we'll just say like the the business business person that wants to put out a book to kind of elevate themselves within their space. Something tells me that's not the not the arena that you're tackling though. It's not, but that is where I cut my teeth on it. Um, I started out helping uh, business guys, you know, money Twitter types, working on their, um, you know, short e courses and things like that. Just polishing it up, making sure that it sounded both professional and engaging. And then um, doing that for a couple of months actually was where I got the idea for doing the Whimsyland thing. After I wrote my first trilogy as an author, um, I did it all myself. I started reading other books and trying to absorb as much information as I could to make a novel series that was interesting and not something that somebody would go, okay, this is just fanfic. Like, you know, try again, bro. Um, and then afterwards, I thought to myself, after doing that with those guys on their e-courses, I said, okay, well, I've basically stumbled my way through three novels now. And I've worked with people, and I know all of these people that are in the same sort of path that I'm on, I guess, would be the better example that are sit asking the same questions I already asked. So I'm going to answer those questions. And then I got to doing it and I was like, this is really enjoyable helping people and getting their stuff to a point where they're so excited and so happy about the product that they have to put out and their growing number of fans are happy about it too. And that was where whimsyland.org came from, you know, it's, turn your whimsy into reality. You have a story in here that you want to tell the world and I can help you do that. It's like getting together with a producer. Like, you know, you've got a, as a, as a musician, you've got a good idea and maybe can't quite figure out the execution or, you know, what are the angles to really take? How do I make this really pop? You know, sometimes it's just getting another, another set of eyes on something to see like things that you don't see. Um, you know, would would the Weezer Blue album, since I've watched a video on it the other day, would that have been the same without Rick Ocasek producing it? You know, you know, for those who don't know, Rick Ocasek was the the main brain behind the Cars, and a great pop songwriter. So, do we think Rivers, left to his own devices with those seven hundred basement tracks, would have would have put out quite a creative and you know perfect album? Some probably not. It take it usually takes somebody else saying here, you know. You're getting a little self indulgent at this point. You're, you know, I think you're really you're not you're not building up this character as much as you need to for them to come in in the third act. You know, somebody like Daniel would have been very useful when they wrote Captain Marvel to say, "Hey, in the broad scheme of the overall MCU, this is probably not the character to use because she could use a few more movies worth of development to make her this powerful within the scope of things." And to get people engaged in the character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things that I get commented on the most when I work with people is after um, part of the process that I have, because I have a very high turnover rate, I try to get a project done within four to five weeks. So I really dig deep into what you're working on, on a, a developmental level, not just a proofreading and general editing level. So I'll leave notes and comments and it's all advice you choose what you want to use you throw away what you think i'm full of crap about uh, and it, no harm no foul but i also give one free coaching session in an hour call where we just talk about the project and every time at the end every client i've worked with is like this has this has probably been the greatest hour i've had in a long time all the things that we've discussed, I've got, a, I had one guy literally say, hold on, let me get my notebook. <laughs> that was really funny. My, my favorite is, was when they go, they ask, where can I pay you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the best one for me. Um, yep. But I mean, there is, there is something special about like connecting with someone, talking about their, what they're trying to do and, and getting to the core of it. Cause 
what I find is that sometimes what they're trying to do or what they're trying to say, they get so lost in their own headspace dealing with it that like there's entire parts of it that they frankly just either forget about or like they don't think about what the real implications are. Like I, I one of my clients that I've, I've worked with in the past runs a uh, – it's a nonprofit company that he runs and they uh, – we actually were, were was an, trying to analyze like what is your business model? Who are your customers? Like what are you trying to do with this? And and I'd, I'd have him tell me what it is, and I go, I, th- I think you're wrong. Like that's not your customer. Like those those people do get something out of what you do, but it's not who your main customer is. And what is your what you think your product is isn't what your product really is. And you know. We do the, we'd have these meetings periodically. He's like, he's like, no, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. And I go, two weeks later, I guess like, you're, like, you're absolutely right. This is like, I've been thinking about our business completely wrong. Like the customer is somebody different. It's, you know, this is the real value that we have. And, and by the way, he, this is like a year into this organization, <laughs> You know, and he and it's a full he's, pivot right there. By the way, and this is a guy who who does fantastic work helping other nonprofits, you know, grow and scale. So this isn't a guy who just who doesn't understand what he's doing. It's just when you're so close to your baby, like your brain is is actually wired to kind of fix stuff for you. I can't tell you how many times. Like I don't care how many times you as an author go over your book to proofread. There's so much crap you're gonna miss just because your brain gets used to seeing it and just completely fixes it before you ever actually interpret what you're reading. Yep. Happens all the time. And with authors, one of the big things that um, I've noticed most of them do is they get lost in the world. The um, They spend so much time dreaming up this place that it's almost like you can't see the forest for the trees anymore. You, know, you, you, you see it so vividly in your head, but it doesn't quite transfer into page. And I have to say, I don't know what this is you, you, you need to describe it to me because you're implying that it's a thing but i don't have any way to imagine it yeah you've never set that up for me before i'm curious if you think of that in any way like and i could i'll bet you complain that like my biggest critique of modern television in particular is that modern television gets too lost in the world it, they, they develop these overarching storylines that eventually take over the shows. Like I, I, my favorite two examples are the X Files, where you know it's perfect monster of the week show, and then you know longer into the run than most shows, but they get so obsessed with what the overarching theme is and like the the big bad guy in the shadows that you stop getting the fun monster of the week elements that are why you tuned in in the first place. Fringe is another example of that, where you know. By season yeah. three of Fringe, like one of my man, favorite shows. The first two seasons are one of my favorite shows, but by season three, it's like they're so obsessed with this alternate universe. It's like, oh, yeah, but what happened to like the cool monsters and like the cool ideas that we got in the first two seasons? Where like we could watch a self-contained episode and just appreciate it for what it was. Now I'm like, if I miss an episode, I no longer know what's going on, who any of the characters are. Why? Why are there suddenly two of everybody? Like, but this one's good and that one's not good and. There's a gaming term called power creep, and it applies a lot to fiction writing, both in comics and in just general fiction writing, uh, which is the longer a story progresses, the harder it is to make stakes because your characters evolve over the course of it. And as it builds up and builds up, you start with a character who's limited and end with a character who's so expansive that you have to figure out something that actually threatens up here. It happens with comic books more obviously. You get to a point where every other story arc is some galactic threat that's going to destroy the universe. And after five of those, you're like, okay, here's another one. (laughs) And what's funny to me is that like that, the idea of that, that's not even how I would attack that problem. I think finding a bigger bad isn't always like the, the idea that, that works. Um, I'm thinking of um, Telepathic Bunny right now and his his story and what, what we've talked about with his uh, his character. And his, the, it, kind of the way you do, like, his character was a badass once upon a time. But, like, now you have a guy who's just been beaten down. Like, you know, 
he's gone through some shit that now he's not the powerful guy he once was. So as opposed to raising the stakes, like you're you're crippling your character in a way to f- see if they can get around in this new world where they're not the big badass. And to me, that seems like a much more interesting story. It is. It's a very interesting story. It can be a bit difficult for some to wrap their head around because there are people who do enjoy the power fantasy, the big, bad, you know, rock them, sock them, knock buildings down type of engagement. But for those of us who like depths of character, an arc where your character is crippled or at the very least reduced in their power creates inner struggle, which is something that a lot of people miss. Inner struggle makes you want to be close to a character. When they have something that they're fighting with, you get the same feeling that you get when your friend calls you and wants to talk, but they're not really explaining anything. They just want to be on the phone with you. And you're like, you get that feeling something's wrong. And I want to be there to help that, that connection is phenomenal. Well, there's only so, so big of an enemy you can give Batman before you have to call in Superman. Like, and in what's funny is like even in that, look at the look at Batman's arc. They're constantly screwing with Batman, tying his hands behind him to try and, you know, justify. And by the way, Batman's one of the longest running comic books of all time. So like clearly you can make it work. And I think probably some of the most meaningful stories in comics are Batman stories. Like they're the ones that stick out because they feel the most human. Like, and, and you're right, you, when you talk power fantasy, it's like, it's great to have the power fantasy, but it's almost like you're missing, like, the, there's, you can get depth of power in characters, you know, it's like, you don't have this thing that you always relied on, maybe you're powerful in other ways that we've never explored, because you always have this other thing to rely on. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the juxtaposition between uh, physical power and what's happening internally with the soul or the mind which is something that Batman writers historically have done very well. You know, for a human, he's better than most humans, but he's still just a human. You're putting him up against Killer Croc, a metahuman. He has to behave differently, and it takes a while to for him to suss out tactically how to take this character down. But then you have arcs like the Hush arc, where it was attacking his mind and distracting his body. So the reader got this opportunity to watch him kick butt and got that power fantasy hit, but they also got a look inside the brain and the psyche and the soul of the character that really endeared people to that particular arc. So while, while we're doing this, we're doing things a little different this episode folks, because while Daniel here is a writer, we're actually going to, we're going to rely on his uh, expertise as a uh, professional story coach to uh, ask some questions like we think of marketing as something a lot of people think of marketing as something that happens after a book's done. And a lot of people, you know, I always say, well, no, marketing should at least start six months before the book's finished. But I think I'm going to guess and. There are certainly decisions that could be made during the actual creation process that can certainly help or hinder your marketing. And the, one of those things that I think is always should always be considered is you're developing a character and you're trying to build this character out to be whatever you're trying to build it out to be. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how much marketing starts directly at the character level when you're creating this thing. Who is this going to appeal to? How, are there ways in which we want to develop this character to appeal to certain people? Like, if you know your market as an author, there's some people great. If you have a story you want to tell and you don't care if anyone reads it or likes it, that's awesome. But for most of the people, I imagine, like, they want to sell books. They want people to read their books. They want to appeal to at least a certain person. And I'm curious, and this could be, like, in the writing process or even in the process of getting the world to understand this character. I think in my, what I've been seeing lately certainly is that we spend not enough time, the creators actually showing the characters off 
because it's like you have this cool idea for a story, but the story itself is it's just a thing for this it's a vehicle for this character that you really love and you're spending more time telling me about a story as a writer than you are telling me about the character and i I feel like that's a, a big negative because at the end of the day what the people are going to connect with is going to be that character Mm, very true we've talked about this um a couple of times now i think at least twice uh but yeah i agree i actually want to roll back slightly a little bit to um earlier when you said six months before the book comes out particularly with the iron age community part of the fear with marketing that i've noticed in the clients I've spoken to is that there's a very fast turnover rate with a lot of us. We're writing the book in a total of maybe six months to a year. Like the actual writing is done in six months to a year. Then we're trying to get the editing done quickly and then the book out to the public and already started on the next one. So there's, there's the cycle of attention that's going into what's being produced, but at the same time, doing it that quickly, it's hard for a lot of us to commit to a marketing strategy six months ahead of time because we are still developing. Like it's still burning in our heads and it hasn't fully formed into the statue. It's still something of a clay mold. And that's a discussion I've had with people a lot recently, how to market these things. I think the six month is correct for most traditional ways of doing it. Cause if you go the traditional publishing route with a, uh, a company behind you, yeah, they want to slow roll and build like that. If you're an indie that wants to, get a volume of text out for customers and potential fans and things like that. If you don't have an audience, you're hyper-focused on producing the value to give to people. And I'm not sure that they have the wherewithal at that time to really build a marketing strategy around it. Well, and and here's what I, my, what I would say to this, all the more reason to focus on characters. Because especially if you're writing, like uh, you, you write multiple books about, you know, within a series. And I understand there are other ways people that like where they'll use like the world as a series. Once again, worlds are characters. They always have been. That's what, Maybe that's the Dungeons and Dragons kid me. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but Very much. You know, every world is its own character. But if you focus on characters as a way to develop your your audience, then... You never, even if you, you never technically have to stop that marketing process. Like, so you start it for that first book, and it kind of continues past that first book into you know whatever books come after, because the character is still the same. Now you can kind of change uh, like the struggles that they go through, and like you know you you thought you knew this character, but here we are pitting him up against this. You know, once again, I, I look to Batman. Batman, yeah, he grows and he changes, but the reason he changes is because there's a core essence of what Batman is. And it's always, how does Batman do against this type of villain? It's how, how does he how does he take on new challenges? They don't need to, they don't necessarily need to start a new marketing campaign. It's, we have a character here, and the, the campaign is just introducing the new challenge and alerting the customer to the new challenge to take that on, you know? Um the other thing I would say is like, hey guys, you know, you can slow down a little bit, work on selling <laughs> more books to the of the one thing. You know, you, you still do the work on the books, and then by the time your your marketing on that first book is done, everything's done on the second book. You start promoting that second book, and you know, you, eventually you could just bank up books so that if you want to go on vacation for a half a year, you have books that are waiting for you to take care of that. I know most of us are people that come from working class backgrounds. You know, it's it's part of why we we're the Iron Age. You know, we're the we're not the guys that got the cushy jobs. We're the guys that said, well, we're tired of you know the elites catering to the elites, and we want to fucking read what we want to read. And that's part of what drives that mentality is is that the 
almost blue collar sense of I must finish the day's work. You know, I've got to do it and get it done and then I can show it off. Not whereas in marketing strategies, you want to build buzz, you know, so you think about that. And if you're a guy that's a work in construction, you're building an office. You're not going to go out to the bar after work and go, yeah, I was putting this building together and this particular room was pretty cool. You know, everybody's gonna be like, shut up, dude, drink your beer. Well, the architect, however, did do that for the just the architect would do that, yes. <laughs> but us who are in those sorts of fields, we don't think that way. And it takes a little bit of retooling to see that. But what's funny is is that as creatives, like they should be thinking that way because they are architects. They built these wonderful cathedrals. They built these monuments. They've built these things in the ground. And more importantly, that they build them. They designed them. They created them. They they took them out of whole cloth or made them out of whole cloth from nothing. And so, you know, so much of marketing is, I mean, and, and don't even think that this is strictly to creatives. You know, the bottom line is most of the crap that marketing is is getting over our own hurdles that we put in our way. It's all the ways that we limit ourselves. I've taken, you know, a bunch of, like, business courses, and almost every one of them has the... <laughs> Let's put it this way, they're probably 70% self-help and getting over self-limiting beliefs, all of them. And it's because the the biggest struggle that any of us does is, I guess, feeling worthy in most cases. That's like the, the you'll say, like those those elites that we were bitching about, they uh, they just don't have those self-limiting beliefs because they haven't limited themselves like that. They're used to functioning at a different level. Now, all of us are more than capable of doing that if we see ourselves doing that. That's part of what the uh, coaching has been about. It's equal parts of uh, accountability, which is have you reached your goal this week? You know, what is it that's, you know, problem solving, troubleshooting? What is it that's you resisting? What are you having trouble with? How can we get you to hit your goal for this week? And, and positive reinforcement. You've got support. You got a person who's there every week which I do with my clients every week to say, you hit your goal. You wrote this awesome thing. Let's talk about it. That's great. You know, build the excitement up and then sort of guide that into the marketing side of it. Cause editing, I don't do any of the marketing discussions with people. I, it's strictly just me working on the book. The coaching is really where I say, okay, oh, dude, what you just said, you need to turn that into an ad. Well, oh, and, and, you know, I, I was looking at the uh, fun, my comic page for one of my one of my guests and a guy I've talked to, you know, in the, the in the marketing capacity. And while I'm looking at his page, I'm, it's like there's things that to me I'm, are screaming at me that should be on that page that just aren't there. And I'm like, you we've talked for, you know, a half an hour about this character and all the interesting stuff that you told me about that character is nowhere to be seen on this page. Like, like. Oh, I, I, I've seen him. Uh, you did say something in there that was really important, and and it's why I think so many. Another reason why so many people struggle, aside from like the we're all working class Joes, is that you have clear cut goals that you're setting for people when they're you're trying to get them to the hurdles. Like this is how many pages or what you're supposed to write in your week, your day, your month, whatever, and when you talk marketing because it's so foreign to people they oftentimes don't know what kind of goals to even set and if you don't set goals you don't have any idea as to whether or not you're reaching them and like one of the so when i when i'm talking to a client one of the first things i'm going to ask them is what what is a goal that you want to reach um talking to you know a client that i work with and uh, you know, I ask her the question, and the first thing she says, like, "I want, I want Amazon Juju, so I want to get at least fifty reviews on this book." Now, understanding that that's a goal, awesome. We we can attack that. Like we can solve that problem. What are the ways that we can incentivize people to go, and you know, put a review on Amazon so that Amazon starts, you know pushing this book because oh it's got a lot of people that are reviewing it that's 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 interaction that means more people coming to the website that's awesome you know 
you know, sometimes it could be as like, hey, um, I want my book to show up every time somebody buys this other book. So how do we incentivize people to go and get your get your buy your book with that other book so that it starts picking up on the frequently bought with tab? You know, there are, there are problems that we can develop solutions for. You know, and <clears throat> you don't do any of that until you have a goal in mind of something that you actually want to accomplish. And and I, I think it's it's interesting, but maybe not in that. You know, it doesn't matter what phase of the process and creation to distribution that you're in. Goals are everything. Like if you don't have a goal, you do nothing. That's why uh, when uh, on Twitter and on Iron Age Nights or any um, podcast or live stream that I get on, I tend to call everything that I work on for clients a project. I don't call it a book. I don't talk about it as a manuscript. It's a project because it's what it is. Until it's finished, it's just a project. And you have to look at uh, marketing is a project. In your early design time, before you even start writing, where you're creating your Bible, you're doing your world building, that's a project. They're all small projects that become one larger thing. And it, so that's an excellent point. Really good. Well, and in that vein, like your career is a project, you're building this. And each one of those little building blocks is a bigger building block to your towards, you know, eventually developing the career, the lifestyle that you want out of it. I'm curious, like, what are uh, some reasonable first goals that you usually establish with people? Well, it depends on where there are to- are in the process, but I'll start with the beginning. If someone comes to me and says, I just have an idea and I want to make it into a book. The first thing that I do is we start with the goals, which is I want you to brain dump your ideas onto paper, onto a document. You know, we're all using the internet now, put it on something, not just in your head, take it out of your mind, put it somewhere that you can look at it. This brain dump is a huge part of any creative process put every thought you have on it down. Then we go through and start looking at everything that's been put down. Then you form it into something that actually has function. You you take those ideas, start building out the world, building out the towns, building out uh, the environments, what the weather's like, things like that. You don't have to get too deep into it. And I have actually had to say, reel it back in sometimes. (laughs) because we all love to world build. Um, But after that, the big one is consistency. That's the first goal. Can I get you to a point where even if it's only a hundred words, you're writing a hundred words a day. Me at the point that I'm at, I'm 1000 or bust because usually I end up staging my chapters at about 5,000 words. So uh, maybe 5,000 or 10,000 at max. I don't like going further than that. So for me, if I'm doing 1,000 words a day for five days a week and I'm taking my weekends off to do things with the family and you know relax and um, let my mind settle down some, then two weeks I've got a chapter of it. And that, that's where I level my goal at. But for starting out, which was the first thing that I learned, was just give yourself a daily goal. Sit down for one hour and try to get whatever you can on the page. If it's 100 words, cool. Keep that up. Build on it. In a couple of weeks, push yourself to maybe 200 or 250 and just keep leveling up from there. Up. And that's what I do with all my, yeah, that's what I do with all my clients. We'll start where they're comfortable. I say just an hour a day. You find yourself an hour, one hour out of a 24 hour period. One where you sit down in front of the computer and start putting words on the page or sit down in front of your notebook. So you're not talking to many parents, right? <laughs> no, I am talking to a lot of parents and yeah, they all laugh at me, but I'm like, you can do it. I was a single parent. My daughter's 21 now, but I raised her from uh, two and a half, almost three years old to adulthood by myself. You were apparently a young parent because you look way too damn young to have a 21-year-old. 
Yeah, I was uh, 23 when she was born. Good Lord. You know, I'm 44. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't have a cushy job. You know, I was working retail. And I worked retail full-time and part-time and went to school to become a teacher. And there were crazy nights where I didn't get home until 2 o'clock in the morning. My poor mother had to sit at my apartment while my daughter slept and twiddled her thumbs until I could get home because, you know, it's just what we had to do. But I, I learned, and that's what I say to everybody that you can find the time if you really want to. And that's what it's about. If this is a goal, a thing that you really want to see done, then you find the time to do it. And one hour is not a hard ask. Well, you, you, you entered into actually a very interesting territory in that it's uh what makes someone do this? Like, what's the thing that, f- frankly, pushes someone? Do you, you, we talked a little bit about the psychology that people had, the kind of self-limiting beliefs. But, I mean, it, it feels like there has to be more than just a desire to, to write or desire to have this thing that is what really pushes somebody. Like, is there intrinsic motivation that you find or, you, that you find with the more successful clients you have? Like, something that just... You know, it's this is this one thing almost across the board makes people cross the finish line over somebody else. I think overall they have a passion for storytelling, and I don't mean that in the writing sense, I mean that in they want to tell people stories and entertain them. That's a more general one. Uh, localized, the most successful people that I've worked with so far, which you know, I am a smaller company and I work with a niche within a niche within a niche. So, um, but the most successful people I've worked with and talked with on a semi-regular basis, they all have a drive and that drive is a quality. You know, they want to hand people their customers, their fans. It's not about, I have a message. It's not about, I just want to tell cool stories. They have a thing in their head that they want to hand to people that is the very best that comes from them. And it's weird. It's almost like a musician in that regard. You, know, you The music, you want to see somebody hopping up and down, nodding their head, tapping their foot, you know, getting in, into the sound those people who want to hand someone a book that they are confident that they're going to read through and go whoa where's the next one (laughs) yeah exactly those are the ones that really succeed the people it's not that there's anything wrong with it don't get me wrong the ones that have a message and but i i say success like in a very you know, we're looking at a success like from a coaching standpoint as you define how what success means to you. Honestly, there's people that even if the book never got published, just having written it may be the most the biggest thing they've ever accomplished in their life. That was my first trilogy. I just wanted to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book. I always thought I would. My mother called me, uh, said that she thought I would be the Jack Kerouac kind of kid that just wandered off one day and came back six years later after having traveled the world. And I never did, but she always thought I would. And I limited myself at that point. But when I did write the tales of Halcyon, I just wanted to write the tales of Halcyon. I didn't care if it sold and I didn't even market it. The few times that I did, I talked about the world. I'm like, this is a fantasy story and it's lots of fun. And that's all I said. It's it's funny that you say that. Cause like I, there's a thought in my that I always keep in my head, and it's the reason I do this now, is because I I didn't I didn't start I went to college and started instead of like leaving to pursue music, like I I chose the safe way because that was just what was expected of me at the time, and it was lackluster, really half-hearted attempt at anything. I didn't do poorly by the end of it, but like really all I wanted to do was create music, and in retrospect. I should have done that when I was young and pretty. <laughs> <laughs> would, have, would have had better luck than trying to do it after college with lots of debt and a lot of baggage. Yeah, fair. 
they, if they, yeah, I had a kid, I had to rationally do what was best for my family. You know, I had to make sure I was making money before anything else. And I got so stuck in that dogma that I put all of the passion aside until I reached a point where I was just like, I can't not do it anymore. It's been there for so long. I have to answer it. And and what I think is needs to be noted about the passion is that when things get tough, it's real hard to get through those nights of that job that you hate. But when it's something that you're passionate about, you'll chase it down like a rabid dog and find a way to do it. Like the, the, the passion to do anything. And get three hours of sleep and have to get up and go to work. <laughs> yeah, three hours of sleep and, oh, my God, I have an idea to put down. I was way, easy, <laughs> way easier. You're not going to stop yourself from doing that. Well, we've had an awesome, awesome discussion here. Where can we send people to go? And if they want some coaching, want, want some help to work through some things as far as this goes, or if you need editing, you know, you're a, you're a guy who does a lot of things, wears a lot of hats. Where can we send them to? Well, the website is whimsyland.org. It's down at the bottom of my screen there. That is where you can sign up for coaching, get me to work on editing your book, or uh, there's a link to a Discord group that I created called Laureate, where a bunch of us authors get together and just talk and bandy ideas, and we look at each other's projects. Uh, it's That's completely free. You can just come hang out. Um, and on Twitter, I am found at Mr. DP Riley. You can follow me. I post all sorts of stuff. Sometimes it's about editing. Sometimes it's about my book. Sometimes I just throw DMX lyrics at people that complain about how it's no longer Twitter. Um, <laughs> that's probably been the most fun I've had in the last couple of weeks. But uh, <coughs> my DMs are open. So send me a message, ask me a question, and I will respond as soon as I can. We'll start a conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Daniel, and everyone out there. You have a good one. Thank you for having me. Do you fancy yourself the next Tolkien, Lewis, or Barker? Maybe you just have something subversive to say. Hopefully this podcast is helping you. But maybe your ambitions are just a little bigger than you can handle on your own. Head over to ironeedsmarketing.com and let Nikki P help ensure your book doesn't release to nobody.